Welcome to our webcast, Accurate Simulation of Engine Emissions. My name is Lisa Arrigo, your moderator, and I'm with SA International, the host for today's 60-minute program. Our speakers are Dr. Sandeep Savani, Director of the Global Automotive Industry at ANSYS, and Dr. Ellen Meeks, Director of Combustion and Chemistry Development at ANSYS. The speakers will answer questions from the audience during the Q&A in the second half of the program. Please send questions at any time by using the Ask a Question box on the screen. You may also use the Ask a Question box to alert us to any technical problems you might have. However, if you have difficulty seeing the presentation, please make sure your pop-up blockers are disabled. Today's webcast will be made available for viewing on the SAE website. An email will be sent to everyone who registered for the program as soon as the archive is ready. In addition, you may download a PDF of the PowerPoint slides by clicking the link on the left-hand side of your screen under Event Resources. And now, before I introduce our first speaker, let's bring up on screen the first of three poll questions for everyone in our webcast audience. Our first question is, how often do you or your colleagues perform engine combustion simulations? Please select one of the following. Routinely, sporadically, we're planning to start engine combustion simulations, or we're not interested in engine combustion simulations at this time. We'll have two more polls later in the program, and we'll share the results of all three before we begin the question and answer session. And now, I would like to introduce Dr. Sandeep Savani, the Director of the Global Automotive Industry at ANSYS. Sandeep is responsible for developing the company's strategy for the worldwide automotive market. He has been involved in automotive technology and business for two decades, has conducted research on internal combustion engines at Purdue University, and has served as an adjunct professor of engineering at Michigan's Lawrence Technological University. Hello, Dan Sandeep. Thanks for being with us today. Thank you very much, Lisa, and thanks everybody for joining today's webcast. I'll take a few minutes to do a quick introduction to ANSYS at the beginning. Uh, ANSYS is an engineering simulation software development company. Uh, here you see the four lines of products that ANSYS creates. First is fluids or CFD solvers, such as the industry-leading ANSYS Fluent and ANSYS CFX solvers to which now are added um, uh, the ANSYS Forte solver, about which we will talk in detail today. The second is uh, structural solvers or finite element solvers, such as ANSYS Mechanical. And the third uh, line of our products is for electronics and uh, electromagnetic solvers, such as ANSYS HFSS, which is regarded as the gold standard for high-frequency simulation. And all of these are coherently connected by the fourth set, which is in the box around uh, the three. Uh, with products such as ANSYS Workbench, uh, ANSYS Simplorer that bring individual physics solvers together to solve complex multiphysics and uh, system level problems. So last year, ANSYS acquired Reaction Design. Reaction Design is a company focused on accurate combustion modeling, whether it be for IC engines or gas turbines or other industrial applications. And Reaction Design has developed a dedicated software package named Forte for CFD simulations of IC engine combustion. It is a solver with a fully automated mesh, so no meshing is uh, required from the user perspective. It's completely invisible to the user. Um, in addition, Forte has one prominent strength, which is that it incorporates the proven Chemkin technology for modeling chemistry aspects of combustion. Chemkin is widely regarded as the gold standard for chemical kinetics, and this is now a part of the ANSYS IC engine solution. So in addition to chemical kinetics, another aspect that is crucial for predicting engine emissions accurately is fuel models. And as we know, gasoline and diesel are comprised of dozens of different components, and the emissions that are generated by burning them depend on their composition. So Reaction Design has developed a powerful tool called the Model Fuel Library that comprises of 40 fully validated fuel components that can be used to uh, represent fuel composition accurately to ensure that emissions are accurately predicted. 
So just like reaction design, ANSYS has over the years brought together several technologies to provide a complete tool set for comprehensive modeling of uh, engines from all different angles. And it starts with geometry modeling. So engine cat geometry, as we know, can be highly complex and analysts would typically require days just to clean up the geometry to prepare it for any type of simulation. So with ANSYS space claim, which is now also a part of ANSYS, geometry cleanup for full complex engine goes down from days to a matter of hours, whether it is for CFD and combustion simulation or finite element analysis. Added to that are ANSYS CFD and structural solvers such as ANSYS Forte, ANSYS Fluent, and ANSYS Mechanical that perform detailed analysis of different aspects ranging from combustion to cooling to structural strength and fatigue. And added to that are a number of capabilities through our partner connections with companies such as Modelon for hydraulic modeling and cooling circuit modeling and, and modeling of the, the 1D side of the gas. Uh, ANSYS also provides a full solution for model-based development of the embedded software via the SCADE suite of products that we see on the left-hand side here. Um, if you think about it, engine simulation is much more than simply combustion simulation. And ANSYS delivers a common platform for simulating all these aspects of the engine. This platform is referred to as ANSYS Workbench. It hosts all the geometry and meshing tools and physical, physics solvers. In addition to that, through APIs, there are connections with various third-party tools that are required for engine analysis. And the platform also has inbuilt engineering knowledge management and a powerful design of experiments tool for design exploration and optimization inbuilt in the platform. So uh, with that, um, like I said, engine simulation is much more than simulating the combustion in isolation, and ANSYS solution platform enables performance of simulation for the complete engine. What this means is that each aspect of the complete solution is able to address different important aspects uh, for an engine designer. The first aspect, combustion and chemistry, comprising of technology elements such as fuel composition, kinetics, etc gives engine designers the ability to predict emissions accurately. And the second aspect, which is a streamlined end-to-end -end simulation process, all the way from CAD to solution to design of experiments, gives engineers the ability to thoroughly optimize the engine by running dozens or hundreds of simulations with ease to explore various operating points and geometry variations. The third aspect, which is ability to perform seamless fluid, thermal, mechanical, multiphysics, enables engineers to do combustion, cooling, structural strength, and fatigue analysis all together, and enables you to predict engine durability, whether the block is going to crack, uh, whether the manifold is going to crack, what is the fatigue life of different components. And the fourth aspect, ability to do a full system simulation of the engine, is targeted at giving engineers the ability to perform virtual engine calibration. So that is um, a, an overview of the complete engine simulation solution platform for ANSYS. And now I will turn back to Lisa. Uh, thank you, Sanjeev. Thanks for that presentation. Let's now bring up on screen the second poll for our audience, uh, for our webcast audience. The question is, which type of engine CFD simulations are performed at your company? Please check all that apply. Engine cold flow CFD, engine hot flow CFD without combustion, engine CFD with combustion, and or engine combustion CFD with detailed chemistry. We'll review, we'll review the results of this audience poll later in the program. Now it's time to hear from our next speaker, Dr. Ellen Meeks, Director of Combustion and Chemistry Development at ANSYS. Ellen led product development and engineering services at Reaction Design for more than 15 years, including oversight of all major software releases, industry consortia, and several government-funded research projects. She previously was a researcher at Sandia National Labs and was one of the principal developers of ChemKin Software. 
Hello, Ellen. It's a pleasure to welcome you to our webcast. Thank you, Lisa, um, and thank you, everyone, for joining this webcast. Um, I would like to uh, focus on uh, combustion chemistry and the role of combustion chemistry in engine simulations today. And I'm going to start with uh, an outline of my talk. Uh, so I'm going to first uh, give some background on um, the role of combustion simulation in engine design. Uh, and then talk about the role of the fuel model within that engine simulation. I'll touch on some recently uh, developed techniques for improving combustion predictions and efficiency. And then I'll talk about some application examples uh, with a particular focus on particulate matter uh, for both diesel and gasoline uh, engines. So first, um, as a bit of background, if we look at engine design today, um, we see that uh, there is uh, quite a lot of uh, things that are changing in the world that are impacting the design of automotive engines and other engines. Uh, and some of those are, are global effects, such as uh, concerns about climate change, um, uh, health concerns more broadly about small particulate um, matter, uh, concerns about material scarcity that drive up cost. Uh, there's also um, fuel scarcity, concerns about energy independence. And these lead to uh, drivers of requirements for engine uh, design. Uh, it means that uh, we want to reduce environmental impact. Uh, we, it means we want to increase uh, things like fuel economy, uh, fuel flexibility, and of course, uh, maintaining or increasing the controllability and reliability of the engine. So these are some expanding requirements that are reacting to global trends. Um, and as we look at uh, the design requirements overall, we have to keep in mind that uh, reacting to those global trends uh, still has to happen while maintaining uh, certain constraints uh, that have arisen due to regulations. Uh, so on the environmental side, we've had uh, continually uh, reduced and more stringent regulations for NOx and soot. And so that's driven us from uh, the upper right-hand corner of this figure to the lower left, uh, where there's a small box. And that box continues to get smaller uh, as we're trying to drive down the emissions uh, for for both uh, NOx and soot and perhaps other uh, pollutants in the future. So those types of constraints uh, uh, really add on to the complexity of the design uh, when adding more requirements. And as a result of how engineering uh, is addressing these growing requirements, uh, we see that there's really a, a broad range of complexity that's, that's being uh, folded into uh, the engine design. And so you know, the, the innovation that's happening is, is great, uh, but it's also really driving the complexity uh, where we're having um, uh, complicated multiple modes of engine operation. We're trying to downsize and downspeed. We're trying to deal with a, a complex set of fuels. Those fuels are changing. Um, they, we want to be able to have uh, multiple fuels in some cases. Uh, we're, we're boosting pressures. We're increasing EGR. So all of the, that is really driving a, a complex design to become much more complex. So how do we deal with that in the engine simulation world? Uh, so ultimately, um, we want to be able to use simulation to measure the trade-offs of, of different design options. But in order to do that, our, our simulation needs to be accurate, sufficiently accurate to really assess those trade-offs. And if in the uh, figure shown here, uh, what I'm trying to capture is the idea that if you are simply um, providing understanding or explaining observations from your simulation, as we would be in the lower left-hand corner, um, there's a, a limited value of the simulation. It's not going to be able to be predictive enough 
to really drive optimization and concurrent design. But as you increase the accuracy of the simulation and the accuracy of, of what can be predicted in the simulation, then you really drive up the value of that simulation in the design process. And so that's, that's really what we're, we're focused on today. So how do we do that? Um, well, if we look at a model of an engine, a combustion chamber, uh, that involves a, a, a number of different uh, technologies. Uh, of course, you have the computational mesh. You've got your Navier-Stokes equations. You've got your spray physics and, and uh, chemistry models. And you've got uh, turbulence models, airflow mixing. And so all of those are, are very important uh, to gain the accuracy of that simulation. Uh, you've got moving mesh, moving valves, moving piston. Uh, but increasingly, our, our focus has been on uh, improving the fuel model. So that's become an, a more and more important part of the accuracy equation for uh, computational simulation of combustion. And when I talk about the fuel model, what I'm referring to is um, the not just the uh, inflow, in nozzle, flow, um, injector, dynamics, but also the spray droplet breakup, wall film, um, wall spray interaction. Uh, we have vaporization of multi-components in the fuel. We've got uh, the combustion model itself, so how the fuel and air react. And we've got to be able to do all of those physics and chemistry uh, in a computationally efficient manner. So. Um, why, why do we focus on the fuel? Uh, so I wanted to just uh, provide a few areas uh, to uh, really motivate uh, why the fuel is at the center of some of the things that we're concerned about today. So as we, as we drive the, uh, the engine modes um, to, uh, to be you know, leaner and, uh, and trying to get uh, um, ignition delay without pr producing, or ignition without producing a lot of NOx and, uh, and controlling for fuel effects, we really need to understand the fuel model better. So the fuel uh, model that we have, how, it, how that fuel and air react, controls the ignition delay. That controls also how much the fuel is consumed, so the fuel efficiency. Um, our fuel model uh, directly affects how we can assess fuel effects, uh, fuel variability. Um, so if we don't have a fuel that can handle, that can even represent fuel variability, we will not be able to predict it. And of course, the fuel model also very strongly affects the emissions um, and other phenomena such as engine knocking. So having a good fuel model uh, is really important to allowing us to increase that value of the simulation by improving the accuracy. So what do we know about fuels, and how, how do we pull that knowledge into um, the fuel model? So in, in you know, the last couple of decades, there's been a tremendous amount of research into fuels and understanding and characterizing fuels. And, and one of the things that we've learned is that um, fuels uh, can be characterized uh, by uh, their chemical composition. So um, as I'm sure you know, um, diesel, gasoline, jet fuels, they're all comprised, um, these types of liquid fuels are comprised of um, hundreds uh, and hundreds of species of chemical components. Um, so it's, it's going to be uh, impossible to, to model the exact composition of those fuels. But what we've learned is that um, because different structures of fuel molecules react differently, we can characterize those fuels by the, the composition of the fuel classes. Um, so what I'm showing here is um, some molecular structures. So you may have some long chain structures of carbons that um, are characteristic of normal alkanes. Uh, you've got branched alkanes. You've got cyclic alkanes. And you have aromatic species that are sort of tightly uh, bound rings uh, and other types of, of 
components that uh, go into the, uh, the uh, fuel uh, blend. And if we can, uh, since the chemical behavior of the fuel and often the physical behavior of the fuel uh, can be characterized by, um, by the type of class of molecules, we can come up with representative molecules uh, by choosing some from each of these classes to represent the fuel as a whole. So that's, a, that's sort of a, a development um, that's been you know, widely accepted in the combustion community. And it, and it gives rise to a concept known as surrogate fuels or model fuels, where you have a representative of a handful of molecules to represent your fuel. So um, when we take this uh, concept a step further, we can ask ourselves, um, OK, I have a fuel blend. Um, I have a, a diesel number two, uh, maybe a, a US winter blend. And I know its cetane number. I know its hydrogen to carbon ratio. I know some boiling points. Um, and I want to match that to a certain uh, surrogate fuel blend. So I can pull from a database of molecular properties, um, and that will be both the class of the molecule as well as uh, the individual component properties. And I can do an optimization to match those properties. And in that way, I can come up with a good surrogate fuel composition uh, that represents not only the chemical properties, but also the physical properties of the fuel. And so um, in this way, we can take an optimization and come up with a very specific composition. In this case, this is a composition that might be um, relevant to a gasoline ethanol blend. So this is uh, one step to, towards having a good fuel model. Um, that's having a good fuel, uh, representative fuel composition. Um, and that's the fuel composition that goes into your model. Uh, but the next thing you need is the chemistry that um, represents how that fuel reacts with the air coming into the engine. So if we think about the engine, it, it really behaves as a chemical plant. It is uh, the reactions between the fuel and air uh, that control how much power, how much heat, as well as all of the pollutant emissions and, and other emissions that come out of the engine. Um, those are all controlled by chemical reactions. So in addition to a uh, fuel composition, we also have to have uh, a reaction mechanism for how the fuel and air react. So that's a set of reactions and reaction rate coefficients uh, for all of those reactions. So where do we get such a, a fuel-air uh, mechanism? Well, over the years, um, we've put a lot of effort into developing uh, what's known as our model fuel library. And that's a, um, a, a big library of fuel components. Um, there's actually now over 65 validated fuel uh, component models in that uh, library. Uh, and as this chart shows, uh, it, it builds from core chemistry, which could be gaseous fuels, um, a representative of, nat of natural gas and syngas and other fuel blends. Um, it includes gasoline surrogate components, diesel surrogate, and even biodiesel components. It also has extensive emissions um, models that build on that uh, core chemistry. So what's important about this fuel library uh, that provides a, a good basis for a chemistry model is that it's, it's self-consistent, so we have confidence in the blends between the fuels. Uh, which is important to representing those surrogate fuel blends. And um, it's using uh, consistent reaction rates. And uh, even more importantly, it's been very well validated. Um, so let me talk a little bit more about the validation history of that fuel library. So the reaction mechanisms uh, for the fuel library um, have been validated through comparisons to fundamental experiments. Um, so fundamental experiments in the combustion world are typically things like shock tubes, um, ignition delay measurements, 
stirred reactors, um, well-controlled laminar flames, uh, and even optical engines or spray combustion chambers. So I'm showing some pictures of some of those experiments here. And what we've done over the years is collected uh, over 500 sets of such experiments that cover a very wide range of, of temperatures, equivalence ratios, and pressures uh, to make sure that our fuel models are accurately predicting uh, ignition delay, flame propagation speed, uh, species uh, breakdown, uh, emissions uh, creation, et cetera. So those are um, the really important uh, uh, behind the fuel model library. So with um, that sort of validation, uh, we can see uh, that, that as we test our molecules and our, our mechanisms, we continue to improve them. And I wanted to show you just a, a couple examples of, of how those mechanisms have been improved over the years. And uh, just to orient you in the pictures here, the, the plots, uh, the symbols are all experimental data. The solid lines are our current uh, uh, model fuel library predictions for things like flame speed, um, species mole fractions, and ignition delay. And then the dashed lines are um, representative of predictions that were um, available when we first started this project. So these are uh, the difference between the dashed lines and the solid lines represent improvements that we've made by doing these um, iterative uh, validation studies and improvement process. And uh, an important part of a lot of this work has been on the prediction of soot precursors, um, poly, uh, polyaromatic uh, hydrocarbon uh, PAH predictions are uh, very important to predicting uh, soot amounts in combustion systems. OK, so uh, next uh, I want to talk about what you do with that kind of detailed chemistry model, where you've got uh, perhaps a multi-component surrogate fuel, and you've got um, availability of a very detailed uh, mechanism from a model fuel library. Uh, now you do typically have to reduce that down in order to use it in your CFD model. Um, so typically we're, we're aiming for a mechanism size that's on the order of 200 to 500 chemical species. Um, typically that's uh, you know up to 5,000 reactions. Um, and in order to get from the very detailed model fuel library, we can extract a smaller mechanism using tools uh, such as uh, our Chemkin reaction workbench to uh, reduce while maintaining accuracy over a range of conditions for a specific fuel blend. Um, so that's typically the process that we use to get the actual fuel combustion mechanism that we use in CFD. So some of you may be thinking now, wow, 200 to 500 species, that's going to take a lot of time. I don't really think my CFD code can handle that kind of um, uh, detail. Uh, it, it, it may just be computationally um, prohibitive. Um, but in fact, we've actually come a long ways in terms of how we simulate uh, the combustion chemistry and, uh, and how we calculate the, the chemistry terms in our CFD. Um, and those advanced techniques really change that chemi chemistry scaling to make that level of detail uh, much more accessible. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of those um, capabilities uh, that we have in our, in our ANSYS Forte. Um, and there are, are some publications that are referenced here um, that you can find more information. So the most important uh, technique that's used in our chemistry solver is uh, the use of a sparse matrix solver. So if you think about uh, the reactions between uh, chemi chemical species in a reaction mechanism, uh, not every species interacts with every other species. And so the matrix of those interactions is a sparse matrix. And if we use that technology, we can actually reduce the scaling from the number of species cubed to 
an actual linear scaling with the number of species. So that's really huge. So if you think um, that uh, you know having 10 times more species was previously going to take you 1,000 times more, and now it's really just going to take you 10 times more, or you can just add 10 times more processors and get the same turnaround time, that's a really big savings. Um, the second technique that has um, matured uh, recently is the use of on-the-fly data clustering calculation. Um, so we call this uh, dynamic cell clustering. And that's taking advantage of the fact that um, in a very detailed mesh, you may have several cells um, that have the same uh, chemical um, identity in terms of uh, their initial temperature and um, uh, the fuel-air mixture in that cell. And so we don't need to solve uh, that, those chemistry source terms twice. We can take, take advantage of the commonality um, of, of those different cells. And then the third technique is um, one called uh, on-the-fly mechanism reduction, or we call it dynamic adaptive chemistry. And this takes advantage of the fact that uh, at a given simulation time, um, some of the chemi chemical reactions may not be active. Um, so we, we can figure out uh, in a very efficient way which reactions are important at any given time or location in the simulation. So all of those techniques really make a huge difference on uh, the turnaround time and the, the time spent in chemistry. And just to give you an idea of that, um, this is a, a plot that shows the CPU time as it was traditionally um, with a traditional chemistry solver uh, was showing that uh, n cubed uh, dependency. Um, but now with the, uh, the addition of all of those three techniques, we can actually get down to something that's um, very reasonable even when we're using 300, 400, 500 species. And that's the level of, of uh, detail that we found is necessary to track emissions and, um, and fuel effects. Um, so with that, I want to, to next uh, talk a little bit about um, a specific area of combustion for the fuel, and, and that's the area of particulate matter and how uh, soot is formed in the combustion chamber. So let's uh, go on to, um, to talk about how we do that. Um, so first, the, I mentioned the model fuel library, which has uh, a very detailed gas phase mechanisms for uh, the combustion of, of various fuels. And at the core of that uh, model fuel library is the core, what we call the core chemistry, what happens between the smaller hydrocarbons that are produced as, as the fuel breaks down um, and oxidizes. And those uh, smaller hydrocarbons react, and they form these uh, uh, aromatic species, the PAH uh, species. And um, as, as you see, some of the molecular structures are shown there on the right, so you get an idea of what those structures look like. And once we get a lot of uh, aromatic species, we can actually have particle nucleation. And then once that, those particles nucleate, there's growth that can occur on the particle surface as well as oxidation. And so um, when we go to model this process, you realize this is a very complex process. And what we've done over the, over the last decade is try to validate each of these steps uh, as much as possible uh, independently so that we, we can put it all together in a complex engine model uh, and have some confidence that we have the fundamentals correct. And so we've done a lot of experiments uh, uh, to, or we've worked with uh, universities and other uh, organizations to collect experimental data uh, to allow us to validate uh, these, these phenomena. And uh, so we have a very detailed soot model that builds out of that. And what I want to show here in the figures uh, around uh, the words here uh, are examples of those validations. 
And if you if you think about each of the the steps that that are taken, we need to make sure that we're getting a good uh, prediction of the flame temperatures, and that's shown in the upper right hand because soot is very sensitive to the temperature. So when we're doing the validation, we have to make sure the temperature is well matched with our model. Um, we're using uh, very well controlled and uh, well characterized flame experiments for these types of validations so that uh, we know fluid dynamically we're, we're capturing what's happening there. Um, the, uh, the second uh, lower right, um, uh, the, the one in the middle on the right figure, that's showing some of the gas phase species in the, in the uh, flame. Uh, those are the ones that give rise to the precursors to soot um, and the aromatics that are formed there, so we're, we're capturing those trends right. Uh, then when we move down to the lower right, we can see we can actually predict particle size distribution functions. So the particle size and the number density of those particles in the flame as they form and as they grow um, over a residence time in that flame. So we're capturing all of these trends with respect to the fuel structure, the residence time, and the temperature. We can get volume fraction of that soot. Uh, we can get the oxidation, that's the lower left, um, uh, captured very well with another sort of independent experiment. So th that's really the fundamentals that goes into uh, the soot model that we then eventually use in our CFD simulation. Um, so that's um, the very detailed soot model that we have that involves uh, particle tracking. Uh, we can also derive from that uh, what's known as a pseudo-gas soot model. That can add some flexibility where you may not need quite as detailed a, a gas phase chemistry model since you don't have to track all of the aromatics. Um, and just to, to show you schematically what that looks like, um, we, we have our detailed soot model shown here where we start with the fuel composition that may involve some aromatics and other types of chemical classes. That breaks down to this uh, cloud of, of different uh, hydrocarbon species. Those react to create uh, uh, soot precursors. Those soot precursors form nucleation. There's oxidation. There's growth. And then from that, we can predict not only the soot mass, but also the size distribution, the particle number, and the particle size. So the pseudo-gas model is similar, but it, um, has, uh, it reduces some of the complexity in the surface chemistry and, and treats that as a pseudo-gas uh, type of uh, treatment to give you um, similar information except not giving you the size and the number density. So it still gives you soot mass. So those are two different methods that we often use in our simulations. And just to summarize on the soot particles, um, this is shown in terms of the pseudo-gas or phenomenological models. You can get soot volume and mass. Um, with a more detailed model that involves particle tracking via a moment method, you can get um, a, very, uh, a lot of detail in terms of particle number and particle size. So now um, I'd like to uh, turn uh, the webcast back to Lisa, who will take you into another polling discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Ellen. Yes, let's bring up on screen our final audience poll. The question is, what are your concerns regarding engine design? Please check all that apply. Are you concerned about efficiency, emissions, durability, weight reduction, and or NVH. We'll review the results of, uh, of this, this audience poll and the other two audience polls before we begin the Q&A portion of our webcast. Remember, you may send questions to our speakers by using the Ask a Question box on your screen. But now, let's get back to Ellen's presentation. Ellen? 
Okay, thank you, Lisa. So I want to now talk about um, some examples of what you can do with that type of detailed fuel model, detailed chemistry, and detailed uh, soot um, uh, model. So first, I want to give you an example for a high-performance diesel engine. And um, would I uh, please keep in mind there's um, a presentation that I'm referencing on the bottom left here. Um, there's, there's a paper uh, in the SAE archives that you could obtain if you want to get more detail. So I'm going to go through these examples very quickly. Um, in this example, we used a seven-component diesel model to match uh, the properties of a European diesel. And we used 500 gas phase species uh, and this multi-step soot model. In this case, we used the pseudo-gas soot model. And with um, this type of detail, we were able to get um, very good agreement over a wide range of operating conditions. So the, the diesel cases that we were working with covered um, a wide range of pilot injection conditions, high load, low load, um, and uh, a variety of, uh, of settings. And so um, we wanted to make sure that we could come up with a model that could predict all of those conditions without changing model parameters. And we were able to do that successfully with this level of detail. So let me show you some of the results. Um, what I'm showing you here are uh, plots of the blue lines are the pressure. And there, there's also um, experimental data uh, shown uh, in symbols. So we're looking at pressure traces. And we're looking at uh, heat release is the lower uh, figures. And I'm showing that over a very wide range of loads and um, pilot injection conditions, injection timing. And we can see that we're actually capturing all of the trends in terms of the ignition delay, um, the, the degree of, um, of, of max pressure, and uh, the heat release uh, shapes and trends uh, very well. And in addition to this, uh, with this detailed fuel model, we're actually able to get quantitative predictions of soot and NOx. And so what I want to emphasize here is that these are not scaled results. These are uh, data versus model um, on the same axes, on a linear axis, and we're, we're getting a good agreement um, between the data in, in all of these cases. And we're getting good trends over these uh, pretty wide range of operating conditions. And so what that does is it lets you look at um, the soot versus NOx um, trade-off uh, and you know how where where that uh, comes into play, um, the model is actually able to capture that very well. And the important point with this example is that all of this is done uh, without any um, changes to the computational model, to the spray model, or to the chemistry. Everything is kept the same uh, from you know except for the operating conditions uh, from one case to another. So that's an example of, um, of a, a diesel uh, case. Um, we also have an example of using uh, the same soot model uh, or in uh, a, a gasoline direct injection case. Um, here again, we also have an SAE paper that has more detail, so I refer you to that. In this case, we also came up with a multi-component gasoline fuel model. In this case, it was reduced down to 230 species. Um, and uh, we have data coming from uh, IFPEN uh, in, in France. And um, what I'm showing you first is the uh, pressure trace and heat release profiles uh, as a function of crank angle. And um, the gray area here is the cycle to cycle variation, um, but we're comparing uh, the a green line is a forte and the solid line is the data, uh, the average data. And then next I want to show what's happening inside of the cylinder in terms of where the soot is formed. Um, so we're actually seeing um, the soot first uh, formed 
uh, you know, near the near the spark plug uh, behind the flame uh, after the flame starts to uh, propagate. And uh, what's showing in this picture, the red ISO surface is the flame front. Um, the black ISO surface is the soot uh, ISO surface at one part per million. Um, and then uh, we can see how that forms and grows. I'll show you some more pictures of that in a moment. Um, we've also been able to look at optical um, uh, measurements of that engine and compare that to the data. So the top graph here is the data, and the lower is the Forte simulation showing the location of soot in the laser plane. And we're able to capture that uh, quite well. Um, as well as the timing, uh, what, at what crank angle we see the soot form and oxidize. Um, so next, I want to show you uh, what that looks like when we do um, the full uh, particle tracking with the moment method, and also to show uh, where the soot is formed, how it nucleates, and 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 what happens to it uh, as the as the piston uh, expand as the during the expansion stroke. Um, so I'm, what I'm showing you here are um, the top pictures, our top-down look into the cylinder, and the lower pictures are um, a side look. And in the first left-hand picture, you can see the spray um, uh, droplets uh, shown. And then once those are vaporized, uh, we get the spark timing, and we get the uh, flame starting to propagate into the chamber. And we even see at that point a small uh, nucleation of uh, soot there. So you see uh, this isosurface of uh, 0.1 ppm soot being shown in the black or the gray isosurface. And then as we increase uh, the crank angle, we can see what happens to that soot cloud um, during uh, the combustion process. So this kind, type of insight into what's happening inside the cylinder can be very useful in design. Um, another uh, example of that is just um, you know, showing what uh, can happen uh, uh, as, as a function of time. We can look at both particle number density as well as particle mass. And uh, we can see that the particle number density will peak prior to the particle mass uh, because we get nucleation of small particles. Um, then those begin to grow, um, and we see the, the peak in mass before the oxidation starts to take place. So you can see these different phases of um, soot uh, growth that occur inside of the engine. So next, I want to just briefly talk about um, knocking as another very chemically intensive phenomena that people are quite concerned about uh, as, we, as we increase the complexity of the engine. And uh, we can look at knocking intensity by looking at the, um, the pressure trace. We can actually monitor points in the engine uh, using monitor probes. We can measure those um, at very high frequency and then use bandpass filtering to get a knock intensity. So these are the types of analysis that are built into our software. Um, and an example of, um, of how we can look at knocking is shown here for a spark ignited engine, a port fuel injection, injected case. Um, and what I want to uh, show especially is that um, the, uh, the, the fuel composition can be quite important. And so there's two plots here of pressure trace. One is clearly showing knocking, and the other is showing no knocking at all. And the only difference between these two simulations is that the one that's showing knocking is a lower octane number fuel, and the one that's not showing knock uh, knocking is pure isooctane. Um, so that's the power of the fuel model in the simulation. Um, so finally, you can, you can actually visualize uh, some of these effects. You can see um, if you look at the flame front in a non-knocking condition and a temperature contour, you can see outside of the flame front uh, the temperature is low. Um, but in a knocking condition, you can actually see the autoignition event by the, because of the chemistry that's happening outside of the flame front. 
So finally, I uh, just want to summarize, um, you know, detailed chemistry is very important and I think it's here to stay in IC engine simulations. Um, we've had tremendous progress over the last decades um, due to strong collaborations between industry and academia uh, and uh, laboratory researchers. And uh, the, I hope I, I've given you some good examples of how the fuel model uh, can uh, really affect your combustion simulations. Uh, so thank you very much for listening, and I'll turn it back to Lisa. Ellen, thank you for that excellent presentation. We'll begin today's Q&A in a few moments, but first let's take a look at the results of the three audience poll questions that we asked earlier today. The results of poll number one should now be appearing on screen. The question was, how often do you or your colleagues perform engine combustion simulations? The most popular answer was A, routinely. Second most popular was C, we're planning to start engine co combustion simulation. Now let's look at the results of poll number two. The question was, which type of engine CFD simulations are performed at your company? And the majority of the audience chose C, engine CFD with combustion, followed by D, engine combustion CFD with detailed chemistry. And now let's bring up on screen the results of our final audience poll, which was, what are your concerns regarding engine design? The majority of the audience said they are most concerned about B, emissions. Their second highest concern is A, efficiency. Thank you, everyone, for sending in those responses. And now let's begin uh, the question and answer session. Our first question from the audience is, what kind of meshing control do you have, especially for the spray path using reaction design? Okay, um, let me try to answer that. Um, so uh, in, the, uh, in the Forte CFD, ANSYS Forte CFD, uh, we have um, lots of different uh, refinement controls. Uh, so you can uh, specify a, um, uh, a cylinder path around where you think the spray is going to be and, and set a, uh, a smaller refinement of your mesh there. Um, and uh, we also have uh, a lot of capabilities in our spray model that help to reduce the mesh dependence. So you don't need to go down to a very, very fine uh, mesh resolution in order to capture the spray effects accurately. Um, so those are, those are some of the capabilities. Thanks, Ellen. One of our audience members writes up that he was unable to see the screen um, and wants to know what the x-axis of the left plot was shown on slide 21. Uh, he's also curious about the units. Let me call up on screen slide 21 so we can take another look at that. So as I said, he wants to know what the x-axis on the left plot was showing and what the units were. I'm guessing he made slide 20. <laughs> oh, excuse me. Yes, slide 20. Yep. There we okay. go. Yes. Um, the left-hand picture? Yes, the um, left-hand left plot, the yep. x-axis on the left plot. Yes, that is um, inverse temperature, so it's actually 1,000 divided by temperature in Kelvin. And the y-axis is ignition delay. So I apologize for the, the fonts being quite small in these. Okay, th thanks, Ellen. Our next question is, soot formation and burn-up is known um, to, highly, to be highly dependent on spray-wall interaction and inhomogeneity. Doesn't cell clustering defects, um, uh, excuse me, doesn't cell clustering defeat that aspect of the suit dynamics? Um, it doesn't if it's done correctly. So um, yes, I, you're absolutely right um, that the spray wall and, uh, and the location of the spray and the stratification are extremely important. Um, and you know, when, when we do the cell clustering, we uh, make sure that we're clustering based on uh, local equivalence ratio in the cell. Um, and so 
it, it isn't going to mix uh, cells that don't have the same amount of, um, of, of fuel vapor in them. Uh, so that's a, that's a design of how the cell clustering is done. Um, and we've done quite a bit of validation against that to make sure that you know, with and without cell clustering, we're getting the same results. Very good. How do you judge a NOC? Um, yes, so knocking is understood to be an auto-ignition event, and so we can actually do that in a number of ways. Uh, we can actually see it, um, as, as I showed in one of my slides, you can actually uh, see how knock, um, how the, the temperature and auto-ignition goes, the auto-ignition causes the temperature to go up. Um, in front of the flame. So if you know where the flame front is um, by you know, flame propagation techniques such as a, a G equation or a level set method, um, then you can see the, the auto ignition event when it occurs in front of that flame. So the temperature, sh if there's no knocking, the temperature should only uh, rise as the flame passes the, the um, unburned gas. But if it occurs ahead of the flame, then that's the knocking event. So you can actually visualize that in your uh, CFD post-processing. Uh, the other way uh, that I mentioned is to, to actually do this bandpass filtering of the, uh, of the um, pressure, uh, and then you can actually get a quantitative knock index so you can compare different um, simulations and under different conditions. Our next question uh, references slide um, slide 31, so let me bring that up on screen. And the audience member wants to know, why does the simulated heat release for the GDI engine not show the same long tail as the measurement? Uh, yes, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm not sure about the, the detail of that, um, uh, but uh, the the pressure trace is quite quite well captured, but I would refer um, to the SAE paper that can provide more detail about the simulation. Okay, thanks, Ellen. Our next question is: Have you done any validation of the multi-fuel model for dual fuel cases like diesel, NG? Uh, yes, uh, diesel, natural gas, um, dual fuel is, is an important uh, application, and uh, we have done um, uh, some, some work in that. We've worked with uh, several customers on, on these types of cases, um, and uh, we've been able to show some, some good results. Um, you can actually have your flame uh, propagate as the result of a of an auto ignition event, and uh, and that's uh, an important phenomena to capture in those types of of um, of engines. And I, I guess I'd also like to say that the um, the model fuel library, because it contains this self consistency between the core chemistry, you know, the C zero, the you know, hydrogen, methane, propane, et cetera. Um, all the way up to the diesel representative components, such as in N-heptane or icosane, we can really include all of those um, molecules in one mechanism uh, and, and, and provide a dual fuels mechanism that's completely self-consistent. So we can capture that auto-ignition and how that interacts with the, the uh, chemistry of the core uh, C0 to C4 components um, extremely well, and I think that's that's really the beauty of of that kind of a of a self consistent library. Ellen, is it possible to simulate new concepts like water injection in a combustion chamber with these models? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, so that's uh, that is something that um, that we've looked at. Um, and that's that's something that's certainly a capability um, in in our software and and model fuel library. Ellen, our next question references um, slide 30, 32, so I've brought that up on the screen. 
An audience member wants to know, in diesel engines, do you find that soot formation comes mainly from improper mixing or more of a pool fire-like phenomena? Um, you, you know, I, I, what, what we've concluded is that um, I'm not sure there's I, I, every engine behaves the same way. Um, and uh, and I, I think it, it depends on the timing of the injection. It depends on the amount of the injection. It depends on you know, whether or not you have uh, any kind of wall film buildup in the engine based on the penetration of the injection. So um, I think it's very difficult to say uh, generalities based, based on what I've seen. Okay, very good. Thank you, Ellen, and thank you, Sandeep. And with that, we're at the end of our webcast. I want to thank both our speakers for their excellent presentations today and for answering questions from our audience. I also want to thank our audience for joining us. A survey will pop up on everyone's screen at the conclusion of our webcast. Please tell us what you thought of our program by answering its three short questions. This webcast will be archived and available for viewing on the SAE website. An email will be sent to everyone who registered for today's program as soon as the archive is ready. Remember, you may download a PDF of today's PowerPoint slides by clicking the link on the left-hand side of your screen under Event Resources. I'm Lisa Arriga with SA International. Thanks for joining us.